Welcome to another dimension, a dimension of insight, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits, there are no boundaries. This is off planet radio. I'm sitting down for a conversation today with uh, somebody who I consider now to be sort of a, a, a friend and a confidant. Uh, we are with Marit, who is in the land of Oz, Australia. And um, over the last six weeks or so, we've been communicating back and forth and exchanging information on um, specifically the, ser the X series by the Dark Journalist which has been focusing a lot on pulling together all of the different streams of conspiracy, ufology, dark science, and what many people refer, refer to, watch my fingers here, the secret space program. So, um, as you can tell, I'm a little skeptical about some of this, but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do what we're calling fact-checking dark journalists, the X-series, specifically around the details of show number three, I believe, which was about Pine Gap and uh, the Blue Gemini Project. So with us from Australia, we welcome Marie. Welcome, my friend. Hello, Randy. Really glad to be with you. So I thank you so much for coming on and for uh, sharing your information. So we've been talking for a while now, and you became very concerned upon seeing um, the episode of Dark Journalists, uh, which was, I believe, uh, X Series 3, Blue Gemini, X, Pine Gap, UFO, base cover-up. And um, as you pointed out in your correspondence with me and as we communicated back and forth, you felt that um, some of the claims made, and they're actually made very early in that particular show, um, you were factually incorrect, and in some cases, um, it appears as though uh, information is missing or distorted in certain ways. So I'm going to let you kind of unpack the narrative from your side, and you go wherever you want to go, Marie. Okay. Well, um, I was just hoping before we actually got on to the um, specifically the Pine Gap material that DJ presents. Um, if I could explain a little bit about how I actually stumbled across it and sure. why I actually watched it, yeah. Absolutely. So initially I was actually, because I do a lot of research and I look at what people are talking about on the net and on YouTube, um, I stumbled across um, Dark Journalist and I initially found some of his shows and his information really interesting, but I, I wasn't actually particularly familiar with a lot of the stuff subject areas, um, you know, the mystery schools and so on. Um, and then I actually uh, began to watch, it was episode 28 and it was um, called X Protect. And um, he was, um, he, look, I've been sitting back watching and, and grappling with his information, grappling with how to respond to this because I knew that a lot of what he was putting forward wasn't based on fact, it wasn't properly researched and you know, he was putting forward incorrect and inaccurate information. So I decided, right, I'm going to, I have to challenge this. It was almost like a public service, you know, um, to just set the record straight. And because I'm actually, I was born in Finland, and so I know a lot about um, the Sami people and the Finnish people. And in that uh, episode 28, he was trying to, he was attempting to suggest that what he called Laplanders may have been recruited by ex-protect agencies because of their ability to use astral projection and magic and magic to become the men in black, right? Right, right. So, and I just thought, well, this is, you know, all the, the stuff he was saying was, it was nonsense, really. Um, dark journalists didn't know that the Indigenous people of Lapland are called Sami people. He called them Laplanders. 
Now, that's both inaccurate and also offensive to them. Um, and then he went on to attribute several stories to the Sami, which were actually about the Karelian Finns. So they're completely, you know, different people. Um, so, you know, because of my study of this area, I, I knew that some of the stories he told were inaccurate. So, um, but to actually understand how he could have uh, made this, how, how he could have been confused by this, and it's easy to do if you actually don't do thorough research, but you have to know a little bit about Finnish history to be able to refute those claims. So I'm just going to, you know, if I can, just for a couple of minutes, give a bit of historical context. Absolutely. Please go ahead, because no. there's a lot of this I don't know as well. And you are in yeah. a unique position of being a Finn in Australia, yeah. which makes this extremely interesting and qualifies yes, you totally. <laughs> Absolutely. So anyway, prior to 1809, the country which is now known as Finland had actually been under Swedish rule for over 600 years. And so this Finland was a group of provinces or regions that had no real national identity, even though they were a distinct people with their own language. And, in, and interestingly, the language is unrelated to the other Scandinavian languages, and no one can really explain how that happened. Um, so from uh, 1809 to 1917, it, it was then part of the Russian Empire. So Finland, the country we now know as Finland, had been under Swedish rule and then Russian rule. And it wasn't until actually 1812 that Helsinki was named the capital and that, and 1917 that it actually gained independence from Russia. This, this it can actually complicate your research because before 1809, Finland can be referred to as Sweden or Swedish territory. And sometimes some areas of Finland can be referred to as part of the Russian empire, right? So when DJ makes his claims regarding the Sami, who he refers to as Laps, he tells some stories about, um, there was one story in particular, I don't know if you heard it, about Ivan the Terrible, um, who was the Tsar of Russia from 1547 to 1584. Now, dark journalist tells this story about how Ivan um, had feared and respected the Laps because he, that he, they were considered to be wizards who could control the wind and had other magical powers. And he talks about how Ivan had decided not to invade their territory, but instead made a deal with them that in, in return for not conquering them, they would give him three of his best psychics to take back to Russia with him. <laughs> now, <laughs> EJ should have done some deeper research here because, back to Finnish history, the area of today's Finland... Um, in, the nine, in the 13th century, the area of Garjala, which is where my mother was born, had, was split east from west. Now, the east was controlled by Russia and the west by Sweden. So the region of Garjala had two sides that, whose cultures kind of evolved separately. Now, while the west aligned more with Western cultures and Sweden, the east retained its own culture, folklore and shamanic practices for much longer. And they remained fairly isolated and were kind of came to be known as a people of, of their own, really. Now, my mother was born in this region and she can trace her family tree to a radius of about uh, 80 kilometres or 50 miles from her birthplace for at least 800 years. So you can see they didn't get around much, so they were quite isolated. Now, because of this relative isolation and the confusion over the naming of the tribes, Stories about the Finns and Sami are sometimes mixed up. So back to DJ's story about the Laps and Ivan the Terrible and how he incorrectly attributes a story to the Sami rather than the Karelians. Now, if you actually, if anyone's interested in this story, there's, there was a paper written by Will Ryan, who was a professor of Russian studies at the University of London. Really interesting, actually. It's called Ivan the Terrible's Malady and Its Magical Cure. So the story goes that Ivan suffered from testicular hydrocele, which is a swelling of the scrotum, and he summoned some Karelian magicians to cure him. Ivan believed he'd been conceived with the magical assistance of Karelian witches employed by his own father, who may have actually suffered that same malady. 
Also, when Ivan was close to death, he again summoned some Karelian magicians so his, to his bedside. So dark journalists claim that Ivan saw Sami magicians is incorrect. They were Karelians, not Sami. So he claims that Sami were feared and deemed wizards. Was actually That was actually about the Finns and the Norse sagas are the source of those stories and they, um, they were referred to them in... Um, uh, there's... Uh, they were referred to actually as the Fen and the Fenni. And um, so he actually got all that wrong. So he was talking about the Sami as as being, um, you know, the, the ones involved in that story, whereas they were, they were actually the Karelian Finns. And also in the Norse sagas, um, it told about how the Vikings were reluctant to cross a Finn because it was believed they could control the wind and sink their ships. Now, the Finns were all well known for their willingness to engage in battles when, when it was necessary, whereas there are no battles involving the Sami have ever been recorded. So that, that all that information, you can see how he got mixed up because he's just kind of cherry-picked a few stories and attributed it to the wrong people. Um, and then he goes on to, to say or to, to um, suggest that the Sami were then recruited by ex-protect intelligence agencies, whatever they are, to act as men in black via some kind of astral projection. So none of that really makes sense to me because he's saying these stories are about the Sami and they were actually about the Karelian Finns who were also known to have these, you know, magical abilities that mm -hmm. were used by Ivan the Terrible. So anyway, once I realised that he didn't know what he was talking about, um, I thought I noticed that he had um, some uh, show on Pine Gap specifically and because I actually know a lot about Pine Gap, I actually lived in Alice Springs, which is only 11 miles by road from Pine Gap and much closer as the crow flies. I lived there in 1980 to 83 and again in 1996 to 97. I've still got close friends who've, who've got a property that borders the Pine Gap facility and I actually visit there frequently. Like I go there every two years or so and spend time with them there. Mm -hmm. So um, just to put it all into context of why I'm here, <laughs> to dispel some of the, the nonsense that he puts forward. So... Well, you certainly, um, well, it's, uh, you're, the, you're the person, like I said, you're a Finn, you're in, Aus you're in Australia, you've lived at Alice Springs near Pine Gap, and you understand the culture and the history of um, the people uh, that you came from. So, I mean, this is kind of a big deal because, factually speaking, there appears to be some confusion. So, I have to ask you this. Did you ever uh, provide him with information that maybe maybe he could have updated that particular scenario? Not not with regards to the Sami people. Okay. Uh, I did with um, some other material that I can talk about a bit later on as I go through my um, presentation here. Okay. Uh, it got back to me. But look, just before we get into the Pine Gap material, can I just preface this discussion? Yes. By that I don't, I'm not, I have no intention of expressing any opinion about the reality of UFO re-engineering programs. I don't know about those. And I'm not claiming to know about everything that happens at Pine Gap. What I really want to do is just pass on um, my evidence, both anecdotal and verifiable factual evidence, which does actually challenge dark journalist claims regarding Pine Gap and refutes the evidence he presents to support the claims. Right. And I think it's important that we say this. Um, the reason we're correcting the record is because of the fact that this is being presented as factually researched information from a journalist. Um, over the last two years, I've had encounters with dark journalists. I have sent him queries inquiring about who he is and what his credentials are because he has made statements about his background without providing any proof and he became um let's just say a little elusive with me 
when I published, uh, openly published a letter that I sent to him, asking him for information, largely because at that time he had basically taken information that was posted from me by Bill Ryan at Project Avalon on the Avalon's website, which then springboarded the whole Corey Good controversy. And as a result of that, I had an interest in what he was doing. I didn't object to it. I didn't have a problem with it. In fact, I would have welcomed a colleague. But what happened in the, the, the course back and forth between this was the narrative of the whole debacle with SSP, Corey Good, and two faction groups that are basically contesting each other for rights to the term secret space program and events around secret space program became very hostile and contentious and dark journalists stepped into it and distorted the field by putting information out again that was i would say designed to confuse rather than inform people about what was really going on in that and for my listeners you know the background on this or you can check it there's two shows on our youtube channel uh, where we talk about this. So I don't want to belabor that. I just want to say that this isn't an act of aggression. It is an act of truth in what we're, we're going to put out in this interview. Yeah, well, I mean, if you if you know that someone's out there publicly, and he's got quite a few listeners, mm -hmm. um, and he's, he's actually presenting inaccurate information, I just, and I know that, and I, and I had access to proof i mean it's taken me a while to get all this together but i just had this determination because i just wanted to you know challenge some of the things that he, he was saying that i knew were actually inaccurate and i i felt it was almost like as i said a public service mm -hmm. yeah i think when, done like and i think when we look at you know the x series we have to bear in mind that this is branding that this is uh basically a way of tagging certain information and conforming it into a package that people can digest. And that's marketing, that's not research, and that's not journalism, in my opinion. So what you bring to the table will factually inform the areas we're going to talk about, and then to our listeners and viewers out there, you decide for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Caveat and on tour. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like I, I can provide the sources, um, you know, for, for these. Um, actually, we've got some documents that, I'm, that we're going we have, to share as we well. We have documents so. that we're going to share and we will provide the documentation that you have put together as a public service when the show goes out. Great. OK. All right. So um, we'll get into the Pine Gap um, information now. So. I'm actually going to be referring to the Dark Journalist X series. Um, I call them episodes. <laughs> it's probably not the, not the right name, but it, they kind of feel like episodes to me. Um, and he briefly mentions um, some of this information in um, episodes five and eight. And, and also, again, his most recent, number 34, he went through the same, the same material. So his narrative hasn't changed. So... Anyway, so it was on this episode three, Blue Gemini X, Pine Gap UFO it was called. Um, just to give you some um, background on Pine Gap. So as I said before, it's it's approximately 11 miles southwest of Alice Springs and it was originally named the Joint Defence Space Research Facility when it opened in 1970. And then since 1988, it's been called the Joint Defence Facility Pine Gap. It's run by the CIA, NSA and NRO. Now, I had to look that up. It's the National Reconnaissance Office, apparently. Um, so it's part of the NSA's globe, global interception system, and it's a huge part of the Echelon and the Five Eyes network. Um, and its functions include signals intelligence collection, control of US spy satellites, monitoring of heat emissions from ballistic missiles, signals for anti-missile and anti-aircraft radar, transmission for satellites, and the microwave emissions from telephone calls. So it basically does suck up all the communications 
and you know, and then go, goes into storage with you know with the, the NSA basically. Um, now Snowden also revealed that Pine Gap's role uh, was in the um, Afghanistan and Iraq wars after 9/11, and it had a role in U.S. Uh, drone strike programs, and also in its collection of global internet and telephone conversations for the NSA. So that that cut came out uh, with Snowden. Now DJ complained. I'm just going to call him DJ for short. Is that all right? That's perfectly fine. That's good shorthand. Yeah, we'll do it okay. like that. Yep. So DJ claims that Pine Gap has been operating and protecting the UFO files since 1967, but it wasn't even built then, and it was only operational in 1970. Right. So he's got his dates all incorrect there. He also claims that it's used for re-engineering UFOs and the area was chosen because they needed to find a remote place as an alternative to Area 51. Now, I don't know a lot about Area 51. I know, you know, the, the basic, you know, general narrative. Now, if we go to the screenshot, the first one, which is a map, it's a Google Maps um, screenshot of the Alice Springs area. All right, so if you actually have a look at a map of the area he's referring to, you'll be able to see Pine Gap is there marked with the red. Uh, can you see that? Yes. Yeah, okay. So that's Pine Gap. Now, if you have a look towards the top right-hand corner, you'll see Alice Springs. Yes. Okay, so that's approximately 11 miles by road, right? Now, Alice Springs is a town of approximately 25,000 people. Back in the 70s, when Pine Gap became operational, there were about 15,000 people living there. It has a very busy commercial airport, only several miles as the crow flies away. You can see it on the map. If you look diagonally, uh, sorry, uh, horizontally across to the right, you can see the airport there from Pine Gap. Mm -hmm. Penallon Airport, it's called. Um, this is the 18th busiest airport in Australia and services approximately 700,000 passengers a year, operates scenic flights, charter flights, etc. Now, Pine Gap is easily seen from the air, okay? You can't actually, you're not permitted to fly directly over it, but you can see it from the air. It's that close to any aircraft depending on which, you know, direction you're coming, um, to land in at Alice Springs Airport. Um, now, on the map, you can also see that it's close to some main roads that loop around Alice Springs, and it's actually only approximately two to three miles from the property that my close friends have owned for about 35 years. On the map, it's the White Gums area. So there's a, a main road um, sort of... Uh, if you go directly above um, Pine Gap, you'll see that there's a an area called White Gums. That's okay. Now that area, that's a main road, and it has it's got caravan parks, houses, properties. You know, it's a busy area. It's you know sort of a it's like the outer suburbs of a, of a town basically, and that's just several miles from Pine Gap. Now, if you have a look at the second. Uh, the photo, which is a photo of the range, the McDonnell Ranges, if you can get that up. It's um, a photo that I took uh, on my friend's property. In mine, it was it was num numbered number two, and it's a photo of some ranges. Okay. Well, um, if you have a look at that photo, I actually took this photo myself, and you can climb that ridge there, and you can see it's not that high, so you can climb that ridge, and you get a clear view of Pine Gap. Now, Alice Springs is surrounded by um, these ranges, the McDonnell Ranges, and there are many vantage points that you can scramble up and get a clear view of Pine Gap. Now, my point with all this, with those two maps, is that it is not remote. Even though Alice Springs is a remote town in the middle of Australia, it's actually a big tourist destination and... Um, Pine Gap's clearly visible from the air and from the ranges. So if there's some sort of, you know, UFO activity going on there, um, it's not that remote. It could have chosen much better places, which I can talk about a bit later. But um, anyway, so that that's my um, 
that's my point about um, uh, DJ's claim that they, they chose that area because it was remote and away from the public eye. Um, so I'll move on to the next point. Um, DJ also claims that there's a what he calls an ultra room at Pine Gap that no Australian can enter. Now, I couldn't find any reference to something called an ultra room. I think he's made that up. Um, you say ultra possibly. as in U-L-T-R-A, ultra. As in MK-ultra, yes. Okay, all right, let's, yeah, that's... made that name up himself. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't find any reference to an ultra room, right? But um, anyway, according to a guy called Desmond Ball, um, who's an Australian defence academic, he did a comprehensive study called um, Canberra Papers on Strategy and Defence. He talks about three areas in, in the spy network of Pine Gap. The first one is a satellite station keeping section. The second one is a signals processing station. And the third one is a signals analysis section. Now, Australia was only barred from the last one, which was the signals analysis station, until 1980. You can find articles on the net about this secret room saying that only one Australian had ever been allowed in, and that was a former leader of the opposition party of Australia called, uh, his name was Bill Hayden, from 1977 to 83. Um, so Dark Journalist has got that part of the story right, but um, that was only until 1980. And um, Desmond Ball states that currently the Australians are only barred from the US cryptographic room and the US is correspondingly only barred from the Australian cryptographic room. So that, that part of it is inaccurate as well. And plus that was only till 1980 that we couldn't go into, you know, all access all areas. Um, so now um, I want to go into more specifically some of his claims that Pine Gap is being used to re-engineer UFOs. No, I said I'd, I'm in, I'd be interested to hear the proof on that claim. And I had, don't know that you can provide that. Well, it, it is in the Desmond Ball papers. It was okay. quite a, a lengthy um, investigation of um, what goes on at Pine Gap. Um, do you want me to give you that reference again? Yeah, go ahead and give us that reference again. This isn't material that I'm aware of. Okay, so um, his name is Desmond Ball, B-A-L-L, -L, and he's um, an Australian defence academic, and he wrote a comprehensive study called Canberra Papers on Strategy and Defence. And he goes into all the aspects of Pine Gap and how it operates and... Um, you know, different areas and so on. Okay, so is that material that Dark Journalist is citing in his work? No, I'm citing it to, You're to citing, say that... Okay, all right, yeah, I, I wanted to, to be clear about yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, because he's saying that, you know, Australians can't go into, um, you know, these secret ultra, this secret ultra room. Well, that's it. I can't find any reference to an ultra room. There was one room... And that was um, only in 1980 closed to Australians. And currently the only rooms that Australians can't go into is the US cryptographic room, but they also can't go into our cryptographic room. So it's kind of a mutual... Um, uh, I, I guess that's where they're decoding things. Well, it would make complete sense that neither party would let the other side into their cryptographic room. That's that's extremely high-end NSA operations. Yeah. But as for the existence of an ultra room, do we know where Dark Journalist ever found that sighting or is that part of his so-called stealth archives? No, he doesn't he doesn't give any uh, cite any yeah, source. I would have thought that, he yeah. just yes. calls it an ultra room. I don't know okay. where he got that from because I can't find any well, that's branding. To... That's, that's part of the script. That's what I thought. Yeah, that's no, I, I, I'm, and I'm not being facetious about that. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. It's a ripping good All right, story. so, so um, the next thing is, um, so 
So in that episode, um, he claims that there's a military base in Australia that services Pine Gap and it's called Prospero. Now, this is where I actually um, got in touch with a um, uh, Dutch journalist and I've sent him two emails to ask him or to say, look, there is no base in Australia called Prospero and if I'm wrong, could you please tell me where it is? And I never heard back from him. So I'm still going to maintain, unless someone, you know, proves otherwise, there is no military base in Australia called Prospero that serves as Pine Gap. What is the name of the base again? How do you spell that? Just Prospero, so... as in Shakespeare's, you oh, know. Got it. Okay, that's what I thought you said. Yeah. Okay. Now, got this it. is important because it feeds yeah. into narrative well, about Well, Shakespeare is actually a meme that runs throughout his narrative in, these, in this X series, so... That's part of the encoding, so. Yeah. So we're refuting so, on the record that there is no base called Prospero in Australia. Well, as, as far as I can find, I'm willing to be proved wrong, but I've done extensive research, never heard of it, can't find it, can't find any mention of it whatsoever. Got it. Okay. He didn't, he didn't return my messages um, asking for more information. So mm -hmm. I'm just assuming he doesn't have any, right? So as I said, I'm, I'm willing to be proved wrong. So anyway, there was a British satellite that was launched from, um, we've got this Woomera rocket range in South Australia, in Australia, and that was called Prospero. That was, that was launched in 1971, and that was a British satellite. It's in the, but there's no Prospero military base. So I, I'm not sure, you know, why he's... Well, it, it's important to his narrative later on, which I'll explain, okay. that, that there's a Prospero base. Sure. So anyway, now this, um, as I said, it's crucial. This claim that there's a military base called Prospero is, is actually really crucial to his narrative because he's saying he maintains that Pine Gap got its name after a quote from Shakespeare's The Tempest, right. a quote that Prospero, um, and he actually, um, uh, are you familiar with The Tempest? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, the te Prospero was like a magician who right. discovered, shipwrecked on a new world kind of thing. So there's a, there's a lot of mystical kind of um, allusions and, and so on in that play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the main characters in the play is Prospero, and DJ quotes from the play, and I'm going to read you DJ's quote. It's just a short sentence. He says, this is from the, from the actual play, and Prospero says this. It was mine art when I arrived and heard thee that made me gape the pine and let me out. Now, he claims that that reference to the pine and the word gape which he then claims means gap, and and this is and dark journalist says this, and I quote: He says, "There is no question that the name Pine Gap comes from that quote." Right mm -hmm. now, he then he goes on to claim that there's a naming system, and that the Pine Pine Gap is code for people who understand this imagery is coming straight out of Shakespeare. Right mm -hmm. now, he goes he goes on to link other quotes from the play to UFO phenomena, which I'm not going to go into here. I'm just going to stick to the Pine Gap stuff. So my challenge to pop to DJ here is that Pine Gap was originally called Joint Defence Space Research Facility, and its first pen name amongst locals was the Space Base. Now the area where Alice Springs is is nestled in the McDonnell Ranges which run generally kind of east to west on either side of the town. Now, if you look at um, document three, it's a Google Earth satellite image of the area, and I've got that as number three. I don't, I don't need them, so. Um, now, if you look at that satellite map, as you can see, there are gaps running all through the ranges in many places. Now, Alice Springs itself is accessed through Heavy Tree Gap, and is surrounded by lots of other gaps. Like all around Alice Springs, you've got Simpsons Gap, Emily Gap, Jesse Gap, Honeymoon Gap, and it goes on. The name 
time gap, and I know this for a fact and I can prove it, came from the native pine trees that were common in the area. The land on which the facility sits was originally part of the Temple Bar Station of which Pine Gap and Temple Bar Gap are part of. Now, my pers close personal friends have lived on the adjoining property for over 35 years, and they also named their property after the native pine trees. Now, I've got another document here, which is the Pine Gap name, and I've got that down as number four. Um, and this was um, written by a Glenville Pike, um, regarding the history of the Northern Territory Overland Telegraph. And that was that really long document I sent you, which I couldn't isolate yeah, the two right. pages. So this was a paper that was presented to the Royal History Historical Society of Queensland by a President Commander Pixley. Now, if you have a look at the first page, which is page 95 in the document, I just wanted to show where this came from, just to you know, to sort as to cite my source on this. So it shows that it was a, you know, historical society document. And then, um, if you look at page 110 of the document, and the last paragraph, um, Mrs. Purvis, who's an Alice Springs historian, tells how John Ross, who was an explorer discovered the springs, you know, as in water springs, which they later called Alice Springs, um, in 1871, this John Ross explorer found a track which passed through the Pine Gap and Temple Bar Gaps. Now, this reference was um, from an explorer, Alfred Giles's diary from the 1870s, and he subsequently wrote a book called exploring in the 1870s. Now, that's where the quote comes from. So it's common knowledge amongst long-term residents of Alice Springs that Pine Gap was named after a gap in the ranges. And there you have a document showing that it had been referred to um, as Pine Gap since, you know, our pioneering times. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's, it was not called Pine Gap recently in you know 1960s or 70s after some line from Shakespeare's play but you can see how the he's feeding in the Prospero the existence of this Prospero military base and then saying that Pine Gap was a code name because it referred to this Shakespeare play about you know this mystical um you know that it was all code you know basically so you know, those things, look, the Prospero base, in my mind, doesn't exist. And I know, I know where Pine Gap got its name, and, and there's the proof there. Let me, let me just interject something here, because we're talking, and i got a plane going over top of me here, so. Um, the Pine Gap thing is a persistent mythology that has been in ufology for as long as I've been on the scene. And... <clears throat> I've had a number of people that I've interviewed on my shows who have talked about, I will call them the mythology of Pine Gap, um, mostly by virtue of what goes on underneath Pine Gap and not on the top of the ground at Pine Gap, and even the existence of so-called um, internal elevator and even um, tramway systems that supposedly run into the Pine Gap facility through underground corridors. So Pine Gap itself may or may not be the official n naming of the military anyway, but that's the popularized name for it. It's the name that most people recognize the facility from. So that's just to kind of inform the narrative from the standpoint of how Pine Gap plays into the conspiracy UFO scene. Yeah, and um, actually, I, a bit later, I, I do. Do you? Are you familiar with Stan Deo? I am. Yes, I ask. Okay, I, well, I'm gonna. Go, I'm actually long gonna way back him with Stan later. Deo, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna mention him a bit later as well. <laughs> uh, look, I, I don't pretend to know anything about what may go on underneath Pine Gap, but I do know that they didn't 
um, it would be it became operational in 1970, and they only decided on the site in late 66. They didn't start doing earthworks and so on until 67. So if there's an extensive network underneath, they've they've worked very quickly um, to get all that set up. But as I said, I, I'm not claiming to know anything about that. Right, and we're going to be very clear about that. We're going to stick with what's above the ground for this show. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, are we ready for the next bit? Absolutely. Free will. All right, so the next um, claim that um, DJ makes is that Pine Gap's a UFO hotspot, and he flashes all these pictures of what he calls UFO graffiti at a town called Wycliffe which he says is, and I quote, right near Pine Gap. He claims that the town, he calls it a town, has UFO theme parks and resorts because the locals are so used to seeing these craft all the time. Okay, so here's my challenges. The place is called Wycliffe Well, okay, and it's approximately 380 kilometres north of Alice Springs, so it's nowhere near Pine Gap. Um, it's interesting that in a subsequent show, I think it was episode eight, he says that he was corrected about its location and then says, and then goes on to say it's about 100 miles north of Pine Gap. Now, I saw him being corrected on the live chat by an Aussie who was, who was actually on the live chat saying it's approximately 400 kilometres north. So why then doesn't he give the correct information, you know? It's easy to check the location of this of this place on the net, but he says, oh, 100, even though he was corrected that it was closer to 400. So anyway, it's nowhere near Pine Gap. Secondly, it's not a town. It's a roadhouse with the caravan park and motel rooms. The guy who set it up was an Alice Springs local called Lou Farkas, and he spent approximately $4 million in 1985 as a tourist attraction, hoping that people heading north to Tennant Creek and, and Darwin would stop there. Um, and so he spent all this money building an auditorium because he wanted to have performances there, a restaurant and even a recreational lake that people could go fishing in or, you know, have some kind of sport, water sports. And he's he actually says, and he's been quoted as saying, it was a business decision to use a UFO alien theme to capitalise on a World War II story, which is completely unverified, about some servicemen who were staying at the well and purported to have recorded several accounts of UFO sightings in an old book. Now, this is all unverified, but this is like one of these, you know, stories that get around. Now, if you have a look at my photo of, um, I've got it as number five, but it's the little green man with the spaceship. Yeah, yeah, the little aliens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I took this photo myself uh -huh. years ago. Now, this is, um, if you look, I don't know if people can see, but there, there's an advertising sandwich board behind the, the little green man. Um, it's clear, clearly a tourist attraction. It says on the board, it says, for all intergalactic flight bookings, please call. And then it's got a phone number. And this is kind of like it's got a spaceship and a little green man to get people to stop there, you know, on the way on all the way up to um, Darwin. Mm -hmm. Now, Guy Farkas, Lou Farkas, he had souvenirs made for tourists and he even had a book at the reception counter that encouraged tourists to write about their UFO encounters. Now, some of these encounters that people talk about on the net are taken from this book, right? So you've got tourists saying, oh, yeah, you know, come and write your UFO encounter in this book. You know, how credible are they? Anyway, so I've spent a lot of time in Alice Springs and I've spent, uh, and I've got, as I said, I've got friends on this property. Now, in all the time I've been there and that I live there and have, um, you know, contact there, I've only ever been aware myself of one reported sighting, and that was in 1996. I was living there at the time, and there was this big fuss being made because two nights in a row a lot of locals saw these intense orange lights in the sky, mm -hmm. and um, 
someone had this idea um, and it, oh, it was actually reported in the local news, so it made quite a stir. Um, and there was one story that circulated that uh, two US um, Pine Gap workers um, perpetrated a hoax. It was like a hoax. But then it was later discovered that there were several local boys and they were caught with orange garbage garbage bags filled with helium and that they'd sent them off as a hoax. Now, I was teaching at a local high school at the time, so I was kind of privy to this information. Mm-hmm. So that's only, that's the only um, reported legitimate, what I would consider legitimate sighting, and then it was it was found to be a hoax. So anyway, DJ's claims about Pine Gap being a UFO hotspot and the evidence he presents for that just doesn't hold up at all. Whitecliffe Well is nowhere near Alice Springs. It's a tourist uh, attraction. And um, anyway, so, and and, and as you can see from the maps, like, it's it's too close to, Pine Gap's too close to 25,000 people, 700,000 people coming in, you know, aeroplanes, charter flights, you know, hot air balloon flights, you know, it's not going to be secret for long. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's not as remote as we're led to believe it is. No. I mean, no. look, nobody's flying aircraft, a commercial or private aircraft, over any base installation in any Western nation that I'm aware of. I live near five bases here. The flight patterns around where I live are marvelously designed to keep planes from ever going over any of these installations. So that in itself is not unusual. And the distances that you've quoted so far don't really make Pine Gap all that remote relative to some of the bases that we do have here in the U.S., which, you know, in some cases are hundreds of miles out in the middle of the desert. Um, This is relatively an accessible area. Absolutely. Yep. And as I said, most people, depending on your flight path and which direction you're coming from, it's very easy to see Pine Gap from the air. You know, you, you're not permitted to fly directly over it, but I don't know exactly how many kilometres is the um, exclusion, here, you know, the no-fly zone, but it's it's not that extensive. Right. Well, so, it's, well from the sky, I mean, you know, it's a you know, bird's-eye view of everything, so... Absolutely, Yeah. So um, I'm going to move on now to the yes. next next claim that he makes. Um, and this is one that you might actually have some input into because um, it concerns um, President Nixon. Mm-hmm. So um, DJ claims that President Nixon was behind the establishment of Pine Gap and that the facility has been doing his secret work, doing secret work for Nixon since 1966. Now, um Again, it wasn't operational until 1970. There weren't even any buildings there until 67. And um, he claims this because apparently Nixon had access or had ownership of this blue book, which I kind of know is, a you know, reported to be um, apparently it's a list of, you know, credible UFO sightings that presidents have access to or something. Do you know about that? The presidents are briefed on certain issues of national defense interest, and then there are numerous grades of intelligence operations that are above top secret or above cosmic or any of the other classifications that we know about. So presidents have traditionally been kept in the loop on some level. There's been stories out there about Kennedy In fact, there's been stories out there about every U.S. president since the Second World War and even before that inquiring about UFOs. And we have to remember that UFOs just mean unidentified flying objects. It doesn't necessarily mean they're intergalactic space voyagers. So there's a lot of rubric and mystery around this that when you boil it down, it gets real simple. Nixon yeah. Nixon probably did have a legitimate interest. I think they all did in wanting to know what what was going on with these these projects that were being run in the background. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, but my my challenge is that obviously the Pine Gap wasn't there in '66, 
the actual site wasn't even chosen until right. 1960. Right, the digging and the earthwork began at the end of 66 and the buildings were constructed in 1969 and the place became operational in 1970. So none of that lines up at all. Um, he also claims that Nixon was intending to announce a free energy initiative in 1975 centred around research on electromagnetic propulsion and claiming the secret research and development for that was occurring at Pine Gap and that Nixon was hoping to make oil obsolete. Now, what do you think about wouldn't Nixon have been in the pockets of the oil men or was he really going to announce a free energy initiative? I don't know enough about US politics. Nixon was, Nixon was, Nixon was being Nixon. run by Henry Kissinger, who was in the employer of in the employ of the Rockefellers, the Trilateralist Commission. Uh, I don't think they were enemies of the large oil oligarchs. Yeah. Well, I think Nixon would have been, found himself in a lot of trouble if he was trying, if that was his agenda. I don't think he would have ever made it to the presidency, first off. And secondly, he wouldn't have had any funds, because who do you think funds <clears throat> presidential elections in the U.S.? Through their well, companies. exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, anyway. I will say so, this. Most of the legends around Nixon are kind of murky, as they are most presidents. In Dark Journalist's case, he was interviewing the late Robert Merritt, who was some kind of insider, inside, or claims to have been an insider inside of the Nixon administration. And he's the one that made the claims about Nixon's involvement with free energy. Nixon was never going to, nobody's ever going to release free energy who's part of this system. Well, that's what I would have thought. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not going to happen. I know people that have de are developing and have developed devices, and I know what's going on in the background with the development of things like uh, zero-point energy. And quite frankly, right now, there's no way to get them out because they will be suppressed, shut down, they will kill them, they will burn their laboratories, and they will suppress all of the documents pursuant thereof. So it's not going to happen. Yeah, I'm, I, well, that's exactly where I'm coming from, yeah. asking you that question. Yeah. So, all right, so now to DJ's evidence and his claims regarding Nixon. Now, I'm quoting, um, <clears throat> I'm quoting DJ here. He says, there is a series of articles in The Nation, which is a newspaper, and a number of stories about UFO development of Pine Gap. I can't go, go through all of them now but I want to grab at one here. In the 70s, there was a newspaper that made a report. I'll show you the article in a... Oh, sorry. So that was... Um, yeah, so he actually flashes this newspaper headline on screen. Now, I've got that and I'm going to show it to you in a sec, but before we do, um, I need to correct his statement here. The newspaper was called The Nation Review, not The Nation, and there was not a series of stories, just one. Now, I've spent a lot of time going through the archives and I've corresponded with um, permanent staff members who worked at that, uh, at that um, paper in the year that that story was published. Now, I'm saying, DJ, dark journalist, if there are more stories or indeed a series, please let's see them because I could only find one. So DJ flashes this news story briefly on the screen. You can only really see the title, which says Pine Gap does sci-fi research for Tricky Dick. He says he's going to get his hands on a copy of it. He mentions this again in a subsequent show. Now, that was either five or eight, but obviously he still hasn't managed to get a hold of it. I've got a hold of it fairly easily, okay, and that's number six, Tricky Dick. Um so if we can have a look at that. Yes, so yes, I'm looking at it right now. The viewers will see all, all of right. this stuff as well. Right. So this is um this is the only evidence that he has. Now the <laughs> this only looks, and this it's looks not like a even very evidence. Incredible right? journalistic endeavor to me. Well, this is gonna be my point. This is <laughs> this is a very, very funny funny story it on the It is about a funny story. I thought this was wonderfully amusing. <laughs> so um now you need to know a little bit about the Nation Review. 
The Nation Review was a weekly paper. It was a Sunday paper that ran from 1972 to 1981. It was independently funded by, um, I think he was a billionaire, maybe in those days he was a millionaire, called Gordon Barton. Now, apparently the funding was really minimal, so they were constantly under pressure to come up with enough material to fill the paper. Now, all this information I'm getting um, from people who are actually there, the, the, the um, full-time journalists that work there. Um, it was actually a satirical Sunday paper, and its role was to provide mocking political commentary, offbeat cartoons and reviews. Now, Peter Manning, who was the editor in 1977, describes the paper as an irreverent publication that was self-referencing satire and a bottom feeder, right? Now, one of its few permanent staff members, a, a guy called, who's very famous in Australia as a journalist and political commentator, whose name is Mungo McCallum, he actually wrote, and I'm quoting here, the paper became a larrikin. Do you, are you familiar with the term larrikin or is that jingoistic Australian? Larrikin? Mm. Larrikin means like really badly behaved and someone who flouts convention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is... This is the equivalent to what we at one time had in the United States called uh, the Lampoon. And it was... A yeah, maybe something like that. Yeah. Mm. And, yeah. And it was basically a satirical publication that got its name on a couple of movies with Chevy Chase as well. But yeah, yeah, you, know, right. you yeah. wouldn't confuse it with an authoritative source of information. No, definitely not. But I enjoyed so anyway, this article, by the way. This was, this was a <laughs> ripping good read. So anyway, Mungo McKellen, who was there for the entire, you know, like he was there when this paper started up and, um, you know, he was a, one of the main journalists there. So he, he and I'm quoting from him, he, it says, it became a larrikin and scurrilous vehicle for iconoclasm and was based around a small group of writers who drank a lot and had a desire to see how far they could push journalism's boundaries. Visitors to the office would stumble through a minefield of empty bottles and a maze of marijuana fumes and find reporting <laughs> concocting fictitious bylines for exposés submitted by disgruntled reporters. Now, this is a guy who was, you know, one of the main journalists there. <clears throat> you can find that quote quite easily on the net, actually. Now, in my communications with another permanent staff member, he disclosed that all the journos, there were only about four permanent staff members in that pa that paper. Mm -hmm. He disclosed that all wrote under several different names because they didn't want the paper to appear to be run by a mere handful. So pseudonyms were common. He himself had to write seven stories one week under different names when some of the reporters didn't come through. So, keeping in mind our understanding what sort of paper the Nation Review was, let's actually have a look at the newspaper article. So, the article appeared in a column called Spying Around. It was published in May 1974. So, it was a fairly regular column. Um, and, look, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but... You know, for instance, in um, yeah, in in paragraph one, it says, um, you know, it talks about Alice Springs. You know, they've managed to keep this, you know, secret, the most unbelievable research project in the world. Unbelievable being the operative word there, I think. You know, and um, paragraph two, it talks about 1966 again, which those dates aren't possible. Um, and then it claims that Nixon had, uh, he was about to announce that 1975 was his target date for the completion of the project, but there had been some kind of compl uh, complications with last-minute flaws to the vehicle they were working on and so on. Um, now, in that third column, it claims the personnel were implanted with hypnotic and post-hypnotic keys prior to the acceptance into the project. <laughs> Um, now, look, so it's clear that this is the only source of um, DJ's claims regarding the secret work being done at Pine Gap by Nixon. The problem is 
despite his claims of a series of articles, it's the only one I can find. And, you know, as I said, I've gone through the archives. So he's basing his evidence on a less than credible paper and one article with no citations or sh any shred of evidence. It's clearly a sat satire article. And this was confirmed to me by a permanent staff member. When I asked him about it, he said, oh, what nonsense. No one at the, at the Nation Review would, you know, they all thought UFO phenomena was nonsense and that the article was clearly a fabrication meant as satire. So that was coming from the horse's mouth. If you have a look at the one of the other stories um, in that spying round column, did you read the one about the job ad for, for spies in Sydney? I saw that, yeah. And what, again, the yeah, viewers are going to see this. And he knows it's true thing. because a ferret friend told him so. <laughs> I mean, it's clearly... You know, a reliable Parent. man for office cleaning. Well, that's that's military yeah. code. That's all code. Ring nine five six eight nine eight after three p.m. Of course, because all spooks work after three. Right. Okay. Yeah. This is. This reminds me a little bit of underground newspapers I did when I was a journalism student. This. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but his spirit. His ferret friend told him it was legit, so he knows it's true, right? Right. Yeah. Now, ferret actually was the um, the um, nickname of the Nation Review paper because it was like a ferret, you know, like nosy and, you know. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's what I mean. So, um, and also, if, if the, at, right at the end of the article, he says, unbelievable, isn't it? When it's confirmed, just remember that Martin told you, all right? Now, I'm going to go into who Martin, uh, William H. Martin was, um, the guy who actually ran this column. But also look at the bottom right. It says contributions to this column are welcome, right? Obviously, they, they were short of ideas and, and material, which is what was confirmed to me by Mungo McCallum. You know, they were constantly under pressure to come up with stories. So, okay, if we look at um, who was William H. Martin, who is the um, quoted author for this um, this article. Now, this was actually a pseudonym, one of the pseudonyms that they used, and it was chosen specifically for the spying around column because if you look William H. Martin up, he was actually an NSA cryptologist who defected to the Soviet Union in 1960, right? So that's a pseudonym. And um, it, that was like an inside joke, you know, because uh, they were using the, the name of an actual um, Soviet spy. Um, now, I did a lot of digging on this, um, you know, who wrote this article, and I discovered that the author of the column was most likely the editor and reporter of the column. His name was Robin Howells, and he wrote under that name, and I reckon he was short of material myself. Um, now, this is where I wanted to mention Stan Dayo, actually, because while I was digging around into this um, William H. Martin and this um, Nixon story, um, I found that there are several other UFO researchers who use this same article, this Tricky Dick article, as their only proof regarding the Pine Gap Nixon UFO narrative. Now, Stan Dayo, I looked at his book, The Cosmic Conspiracy, The Index, and he talks about Pine Gap in Chapter 1, but this is the only evidence he cites for his, his story about Pine Gap. So I found that interesting. And the other one was a, a guy called Bill Chalker, and he wrote um, The Oz Files, The Australian UFO Story. Now, both Bill Chalker and Stan Dayo, they both, both worked out that the name... William H. Martin was a fake name, but they nevertheless accepted the story that was um, being put forward. In all, that article was credible, and they go on to quote that article as being proof. So, now, all of this stuff, so Stan Dale also used this same article as the basis for his Pine Gap scenario. He did, yes. Okay. That in would actually book. make a great deal of sense. I don't want to be unkind. Well, maybe I do. Anyway, I'll just say this. Uh, Stan Day is an interesting character. He's actually uh, 
known for a lot of his work in the Christian publishing as well, and he is a proponent of the Christian rapture doctrine. Um, he's written about, you know, kind of wild stuff for a long time, but he's not real famous for documenting much of anything. So, well, look, um, I haven't, I haven't extensively looked him up, but I looked up everything I could find about Stan Deo uh, with references to Pine Gap, and that's basically in Chapter 1 of his book, which I went through, that book, Cosmic Conspiracy, that is the only evidence he puts forward, credible evidence, supposedly cre credible evidence, to support that story. So this tricky dick article got around, but no one realised it was a satire article. Or maybe they did and they just, you know, <laughs> you know, just didn't tell us about it. <laughs> we don't have a modern equivalent of the National Lampoon anymore because people don't read anymore, but these kind of publications were popular uh, in the 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s, the internet basically killed literacy, so nobody even reads satire anymore. But that's what this basically yeah. is, it's satire. Absolutely. And that was confirmed to me by these two public, uh, two um, permanent <laughs> staff members. So, but anyway, look, dark journalist, he, he actually realises that William H. Martin is a pseudonym, but he, he refers to him and tells us that he was an aviation person. Now, obviously, that suits his narrative better because aviation goes with the UFO stuff. But William H. Martin was actually um, an NSA cryptologist, right? Which, so... <laughs> who defected in 1960 to the Soviet, to the Soviet Union, Union. Yeah. Yeah, but in wrote, 1960. And he yeah. became the nom de plume for this satirical he article yeah. that, uh, yeah, this is, this is great. So, anyway, look, I'm not saying, look, the Nation Review was actually a very popular paper amongst people. Well, I, I, I love people. stuff like yeah. this. I grew up reading uh, Mad Magazine here in the U.S., so what can I yeah. say? Well, they, they did have some good stories, but it was sure. mainly opinion pieces. Well, this kind of newspaper in the day, because we had them here in the U.S. too, they were... They were there for amusement. People bought them because it, uh, we still have them here, the tabloids and things like that. This was kind of a kind of a tabloid publication. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they had some serious writers. Sure. But, you know, and the National... It was more of a national you, I'm sorry, I mm. talked all over you there, so... Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, Mary, um, no. But... I mean, I love reading stuff like this, but this is not exactly hard documentation evidence. No, absolutely not. So, um, anyway, just to sum sum up this section, it's like that's it's clearly a satire article from a satirical Sunday paper, and it is the only evidence presented by dark uh, journalists to support his claims regarding that Nixon Pine Gap UFO um, narrative. So, and I reckon it's no wonder he never gets his hands on a copy of that article to show the audience, you know, because, you know, he just really flashes it up on screen. But if you had a closer look at it, you'd just ask You know, that's questions. actually, uh, a, friend and, a friend of mine and I have both made the same comment that's been largely, those documents are flipped in front of you for a brief second. And yeah. it really isn't an effective way to communicate documents. So... For our purposes on this show tonight, we're going to try and show you everything that Marita's discussing, and we'll give you full frontal view of it in screen, and we'll also upload this as a PDF or something so that you can even look at it. How's yep, that? That'd be great. Yeah, that yep. works. So yep. maybe we can stop and review, take a breath for a minute, and just, yep. what have we discounted so far about the narrative of this uh, presentation of X, the X-Series 3 Blue Gemini X-Pine Gap UFO-based cover-up? Well, firstly, he, his claims that um, that, pine, that area where Pine Gap is was chosen because of its remoteness, well, I think I've demonstrated it's really not that remote. Um, and he's got his dates all wrong as well. Um, secondly... 
um, the where Pine Gap got its name and the fact that he's claiming that there's a Prospero military base, which feeds into the Pine Gap naming, you know, coding system that goes back to Shakespeare's Tempest. Um, and now I think this this is something he's going to pick up m- more on because he was talking about other references in in another show. To um, are you familiar with the the novel Wrinkle in Time? A Wrinkle in Time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, he talks a lot about that, and he yeah. now I don't remember the name of the woman who wrote that. It was a French name, I think. He was claiming that she was connected to some mystery schools, and she was giving clues about Pine Gap in that as well. So. It was too much of a rabbit hole to go down from. <laughs> well, this is a, this, I mean, A Wrinkle in Time's been a popular book, but it, uh, this is, a, again, you know, remember that the core fundamental of this series that he's putting out has to do with what he calls steganography or the ex-steganography, which means data encoded Steganography, strictly speaking, is code that's embedded into an image, an online image such as a JPEG. Yeah. And um, so he's applied that metaphor to this as a way, as a way to, um, as a way to embed coding, which he will then, this is interpretive is what he's doing. It's hugely interpretive because most of the meanings behind things that are embedded in these works of literature, and especially Shakespeare, are interpretive. Yeah, and I mean, look, I don't know anything about the wrinkle in time and the, the allusions that he's making there to Pine Gap, but I do know the Tempest and I do know where Pine Gap got its name. So... I mean, from, from my perspective, the two areas that I know about, that I've listened to him talk about, none of it's credible. So I'm wondering, what about all the other 30 whatever shows, you know? Like, you know, how credible are, you know, the claims he's making in his other shows, you know? Well, I think we have to go there for a second and say that... Um, if we're going to present research as a journalist, our prime, our major premise has to be able to stand up consistently throughout a series. So when we begin to take apart the, pre- the premise of this particular show, we're also untangling the major premise in a series. Yeah, well, as I said, because um, I, I have actually read Wrinkle in Time. That was a long time ago. And I, I didn't have time to go through it again or, you know, I just wanted to confine myself with the material that I was familiar with. But, you know, he does bring this in um, into the narrative and um, and <clears throat> I suspect that it's it's just as um, speculative as, as, um, as his stuff on Pine Gap, really. All right, and but for the record, too, A Wrinkle in Time was written by an American author named Madeleine Langell, or Langle. Oh, okay. Oh. So, <clears throat> right, yeah. French name, American, yeah, in yeah. 1962. So this is uh, this book's been around for decades. Yeah. But um, he, uh, there's something, um, it's about a physicist who's, you know, moving around in different timelines or something. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I can't really talk to that. All right. <clears throat> so I'm just sort of I'm letting you do the I'm letting you do the narration and I'm just sort of the color commentary guy. So <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, sure. That's fine. Um so the next um claim that um DJ makes about Pine Gap is um concerns our Prime Minister, who was Prime Minister from nineteen sixty six to nineteen sixty seven. Now his name was Harold Holt. Yes. DJ claims he was assassinated because he wanted to close Pine Gap. Now, I'm quoting from DJ here. He says, after he was elected, the US came across immediate resistance from Holt, and he's the guy in 67 who says, I don't want to do this. Right, so he's claiming that as um, as soon as Harold Holt got in, he's saying, no, we're not going to do this. Now, again, there's an issue with the dates, because we're looking at 1966 again. 
Um, so my challenge is um, you have, I have to go into a little bit of information about um, Holt here. But yes. he was the leader of the Conservative Party. And our president, your President Johnson, came to visit Australia in 1966 because he wanted to bolster Holt's election chances. Um, now, Holt won that election, and that same year, in December 1966, only months, just a few months after the election, he signed the treaty for the Joint Defence Research Facility with President Johnson, which would become Pine Gap. So they made that agreement together in, at the end of 66. Um, now, they became close personal friends, Johnson and Holt, and there's lots of photos of them socialising. Interestingly, Holt's wife, um, Zara, she continued to visit Johnson at his Texas ranch even after her husband's disappearance. So they obviously became good friends. Mm -hmm. Now, Holt visited Johnson in the States and on his return, Holt escalated Australia's involvement in the Vietnam War. And he announced to the Australian public that we are all the way with LBJ. Um, now, some politicians in Australia, they were concerned about having US military bases on Australian soil, but Holt assured the public that no weapons would ever be fired from them and that they wouldn't make our country a target. So Holt was all in favour of this, right? So he was definitely not against US military bases in Australia, including Pine Gap. So to Holt's disappearance. Now, Holt was a keen swimmer and he was a spear fisherman. And um, he disappeared while swimming in heavy seas at a beach near his holiday home close to Melbourne, and his body was never found. Now, yes, his disappearance did seem very suspicious and there were lots and lots of conspiracy theories about what happened to him, but not one of those was about Pine Gap. Um, Pine Gap wasn't even built then yet. Um, they only signed the treaty in December 66. See that, so, see that again. Pine Gap wasn't um, even built. Wasn't then. even built then, No. So they only signed the treaty agreement in December 1966, and that's when they started looking for a, a um, potential site that would be suitable, right? Okay. So uh, now there, I just wanted to go quickly run through a few of the conspiracy theories about Holt's death. Um, now, one popular one that he was a, he'd been a spy for China since the early 1930s. Um, and he feared detection by the Australian intelligence officers. So he was he sought political asylum and was picked up by a Chinese mini sub that was waiting for him off the beach. And now there's a yeah, that's the one there that you've got the um, Hong China that's number seven. So that was a big conspiracy theory going around that was re reported in the newspaper. I bet, you he went, I bet you he went to that secret base in Antarctica. I bet you that's where he's at. <laughs> he's just going to go to Antarctica. I know it. Is it? Okay. <laughs> I don't have anything on An Antarctica <laughs> in this. Anyway, continue. No, I, 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 yeah. I needed to inject some levity there. No, no, that's all right. Look, that was, um, it didn't have the source on that, but that was actually in the Age newspaper, which is a, a major Melbourne newspaper. Um, and Michelle Grattan, who wrote that, she's a very well-respected journalist um, in Australia. So that was one of the theories. Um, another conspiracy theory was that he was about to challenge the US oil barons by announcing that Australia was going to establish a nuclear um, industry and that we were going to be the new Saudi Arabia of atomic energy. Um, and there's a couple of, um, it's actually two documents, but one's the first, there's, so it's a, it's a continuation of the same, um, the same article. So you've got, um, they were numbered eight and nine on mine. So, yeah, so the story goes, you know, this conspiracy theory goes that uh, he was about to announce a nuclear power station was going to be built at a place called Jarvis Bay in New South Wales. So um, now that, <clears throat> interestingly, that um, those newspaper articles were 
this took me a lot of time to work out because there were no sources on this and um, they were actually published in a paper called The Nation. Now, which is what um, Dark Journalist was confused about with The Nation and The Nation Review. But um, So this was a fort fortnightly paper and it was an official newspaper of, a, of one of um, the branches, the state, uh, Queensland state branch of the Australia's One Nation political party, which was a nationalist right-wing populist party. It's still running today. So again, it's it's a you know it's a it's a newspaper with you know a particular agenda and particular following. Now the interesting thing about this is that the author, a Carl D. Thompson, um, he was actually the former editor and publisher of this paper, and he was eventually sacked and disgraced in 2006 after publishing some anti-Semitic material that was um, declared actually or found unlawful in the Federal Court of Australia under our Racial Discrimination Act. Now, a newspaper representative apologised on his behalf and the paper was shut down. Uh, you know, these, so there were all these conspiracy theories about this. After that, that Carl um, Thompson, he took charge of the Brisbane branch of the White Pride Coalition of Australia and um, he wasn't viewed very favourably at all. There were all sorts of nasty rumours about what sort of a person he was and what he was involved in, which I won't go into because it's character assassination. But anyway, and then there was another theory too that Holt had faked his own death so he could run off with a mistress. So you can see there was all these conspiracy theories floating around, but not one of them mentioned Pine Gap and or since. So the only theory um, that um, Dark Journalist mentions and he says he's going to give us this man's name in a website. So, sorry, I'll have to retract there. The only reference to Pine Gap being involved or being, you know, a part of Holt's disappearance that DJ mentions um, is this, um, there's a guy who's got a website and DJ says, I'll give you this man's name and his website, but he never actually does. He never comes up with the material. Well, I actually dug it up. And um, so the theory, and I'll tell you a little bit about the theory and the man. So you're going to fill in the blanks on the information that dark journalists referenced but never bothered to source. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, there's this guy called Gary Simmons, and he he has um, a website. And if anyone wants to have a look at it, which is a, it's a very interesting website, it's called Harold Dash Holt dash net and it's very easily found on, on the web. Now he was a Navy clearance diver and he claims to have towed Holt's Harold Holt's body to the sea floor the day before he was reported missing. Now he says he's only got flashes of memory of the operation because he'd been subjected to drug and mind control experiments by, mm -hmm. by government intelligence agencies. Mm -hmm. Now he claims that he met a man at the shore and was given a body bag which he had to swim with and tow to the waiting fishing boat. Now, I don't know how you do that. You swim towing a body bag. Anyway, he must have been a great swimmer. Anyway, when he got to the boat, he opened the bag and Holt was still alive. Now, I don't know that how that is possible either, but anyway. Um, and then he says that he anchored Holt to the sea floor with a tether that was supposed to come apart after a few days so that the body could be found. And he says, that part didn't work. I think I took him too deep, 70 feet. So this is his story. Now, um, on his website, now it's an extensive website, and it goes in. Give me, give me that website one more time, please, yeah. Marie. It's called Harold-Holt-Net. Now, interestingly, he hasn't, um, he, there's been no activity on that by him since... Uh, is it 2009 or something? So on that website, there's a lot of, um, there, he goes into all sorts of subjects. There's all this, you know, this sovere sovereignty um, stuff and um, police stuff and, um, you know, there's a whole range of, of um, subject area he goes into. And um, one of them is that Holt's disappearance. Now, I've looked at all the stuff on Harold Holt on his website 
and there's only one sentence where, you know, he says Holt was murdered because of Pine Gap. There's no reasons as to why he says that, how he came to that conclusion, no evidence, no commentary other than one sentence. I reckon um, Dark Journalist, he, he doesn't give us that guy's name or the website because if you look at the website, you, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of red flags there. So anyway, if we go to on my list, it's um, document 10 and it starts off murder, Carl Thompson. And um, that's a newspaper article about this um, Gary Simmons who claims to have towed Harold um, Holt's body. Former Navy diver reveals role in Harold yeah. Holt mystery. Okay. But so now that's that's his story, and that's the only the only um, the only uh, story I could find on it. Um, now this story, if you have a look, well, actually maybe it's not there, but I found that this was um, published in that same newspaper, The Nation, in two thousand and four, and was written by who else but Carl D. Thompson, the same guy who was sacked and discredited because of um, the anti-Semitic material. So this was, um, that's, um, there's no mention of Pine Gap in this article, by the way, not not one mention of Pine Gap. So, so explain no Coral, say that again about Coral D. Thompson. Who is he exactly? He's the guy that um, wrote this story about, um, let me just go back here, um, in the Nation newspaper about the, um, conspiracy theories about the yeah. big oil murdering, um, assassinating Holt because of his um, wanting to start a nuclear energy got industry. It, got it. Okay. So this, so this is, is the same guy. Yeah. This is the only so-called journalist who, um, <laughs> who entertained this story by this Navy diver, right? Now, this Navy diver who's got that, whose name's Gary Simmons, who has this um, website, um, which is, you know, the one that I said that was interesting to have a look at. There's one sentence there in all the material on Harold Holt and this story that even mentions Pine Gap. That, that, that's it, basically. Basically, um, there is no evidence whatsoever or any F references linking Holt's disappearance to Pine Gap apart from one sentence on this man's website, right? Now... And Gary's story, Gary Simmons' story, is told by only one disreputable journalist and published in one disreputable newspaper. So, um, and there's no evidence of Holt wanting to change his mind about having US military bases in Australia only one year after he signed the treaty with Holt, uh, sorry, with Johnson, President Johnson. So um, DJ's claims that Holt was assassinated because of Pine Gap um, not credible at all. Got it. Yep. Right? So, and I've got one other area that I want to talk about. It's, it's, it's kind of like turning into a lecture, but there's so much background information. This is the nature of Dark Journalist's um, narrative, that he cherry-picks all these really obscure references to things and then puts them together in what, to, to the uninitiated or... Well, he's called, he's admitted this. It would be credible. Let's remember, he's calling this the stealth archives. Yeah. Okay, that's the stealth archives. They're so, stealth, they're so stealthy that you can't find, you can't actually find it them, really. disappeared. Randy. So the yeah. next one, he says he holds up photos of another prime minister we had called Gough Whitlam. Now, um, he claims that Gough Whitlam, who was Australia's prime minister from... 1972 to 1975, was dismissed because he was going to close Pine Gap. Now, um, for you guys in the States, you probably don't know about this, but it was uh, considered a huge constitutional crisis in Australia. And um, so I have to just kind of give you a bit of background here. When did this occur? When, when... 1975, he was dismissed. Okay, yeah, we've never got a lot of Australian news or... You know, we never did in the U.S. We rarely hear about Australia. That's that's tragic. Yeah. Well, so, we, no, we, we say that we're, we're just another state of um, the U.S. apparently. 
But this was would would be kind of like our own Watergate kind of thing or the impeachment. Absolutely. Of Clinton. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm gonna tell you the whole story of this. It's it's quite fascinating. I think Australians might find it more interesting than, you know, your people over there, but you know, the um your CIA and, and so on were integral in, in, in this story. So anyway. So yeah, so DJ claims that he was um dismissed because he wanted to close Pine Gap. Now, even though I'm going to mention Pine Gap, it does get a mention here, it is not the reason Whitlam was sacked and it was certainly not because of any secret UFO re-engineering um, that was taking place there, okay? So just a little bit of background on um, Whitlam and, and his, his election as Prime Minister. Now, when he was ele elected in 1972, we had had 23 years of Conservative government and this was a time when there was, you know, change was in the air. People wanted change. Now, Rupert Murdoch, you know who he is, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, News you know, he was originally States Australian. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was uh, an Australian man who, he was the propri proprietor of uh, a group of papers called News Limited in yes. Australia. Mm -hmm. Now, he was in support of Whitlam in the beginning. Um, and there was this massive media campaign under the slogan, It's Time, which Murdoch, um, all these famous actors and other celebrities got behind. And um, Whitlam, he was elected, um, and he quickly implemented lots and lots of changes, new programs and policy changes. Now, he was very left-leaning. Um, so, you know, just to, for example, a few of them in, in, in just two short years, he terminated military conscription. He introduced universal health care, free university education, legal aid programs, recognised Aboriginal land claims, opposed nuclear weapons testing in the Pacific, withdrew our troops from Vietnam, introduced no-fault divorce, abolished the death penalty, granted independence to Papua New Guinea, opened uh, equal pay case and... Uh, uh, and appointed a woman to the commission. Eliminated sales. You had a prime minister that did all this and lived. Wow. Yes. He eliminated the sales tax on the contraceptive pill. He gave major grants to the art and voted in favour of sanctions on South Africa for the apartheid um, policies. Now this is um, this is in just this is only a, a part of what he did in two short years, right? Now, another contentious thing was that he wanted to, what he called, buy back the farm. Believe, and he believed that foreign powers shouldn't control our country's resources and dictate economic and foreign policies. Now, at that time, the biggest owner of Australian resources was the Anglo-Dutch Aura, which is now known as Rio Tinto, along with other British mm -hmm. interests. Yes, of course. Now, in, yeah. okay, so in 1973... He commissioned the Fitzgerald Review, um, which discovered extraordinary degrees of foreign ownership and expatriation of, of profits from Australia. Now, the Foreign Investment and Review Board, he introduced that to monitor all foreign investment in Australia, and he passed legislation that mandated all proposals were to be checked by the Department of Treasury to ensure that they are in our national interests. So you can see that in just several years, Whitlam, the Whitlam government made a lot of changes and a lot of them threatened foreign countries and corporations with interest in Australia, right? Yeah, that's very threatening to the, to the power structures. I'm in awe of yeah. somebody that could have done that. Yeah. So while Whitlam was pursuing this leftist course, we come back to Murdoch here now, yeah. Murdoch actually gone to live in New York at this time and he was expanding his empire and he was being courted by the Republicans um, as he expanded his business in the United States and he started veering to the right politically. Well, this is Fox News in the US, Rupert Murdoch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, Murdoch was infuriated with Whitlam when he rejected, or the Whitlam government rejected, 
a submission he made to waive foreign investment rules to allow him, Murdoch, to open a bauxite mine in Western Australia with US partners. So he was he was trying to get favours from Whitlam to waive these foreign investment um, rules, kind of as a you know thank you for helping him get elected, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. In a de in a declassified secret diplomatic telegram that was dated January the twentieth, nineteen seventy five. This is you know in the same year earlier in that year that he was dismissed. It was reported that Rupert Murdoch had issued a confidential instruction to editors of his newspapers to, and I quote, kill Whitlam. Now, he didn't mean kill him as in literally. He meant kill his chances as, you know, bring him down as, as PM, right? Right. So, so <clears throat> this was about 10... Sorry? Yeah, political assassination is what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. Now, this was about 10 months before Whitlam was actually dismissed. So the News Limited Group, which was Murdoch's um, newspaper group, they savaged Whitlam and they strongly backed the opposition leader, who was called Malcolm Fraser, so much so that journalists at his own newspaper, one of his own newspapers, The Australian, they took industrial action in protest against Murdoch because they'd been given this instruction Whitlam. Now, <clears throat> apparently the Whitlam government uh, at this time was seen as semi-legitimate semi at best by the Nixon administration, as well as by the CIA and ASIO, which was the Australian Security Intelligence Service, and ASIS, which was the Australian Secret Intelligence Service. They were not pleased with the left-leaning agenda, which could threaten, you know, foreign interests in Australia. <clears throat> Um, another area that made Whitlam very unpopular with foreign governments was his stance on the Vietnam War. Now, after the bombing, the US bombing of Hanoi in 1972, Whitlam discovered that the United States had used one of our bases to put its forces on nuclear war footing during the Israel-Egypt Yom Kippur War in 1973 without informing Whitlam at all. And so Whitlam, in retaliation, questioned the advantage of having spy bases in Australia because they were bypassing, you know, they, they weren't actually, they were our bases on our soil and we weren't being informed that there was a nuclear, that one of our bases had been put on nuclear war footing, right? So then, you know, well, what's the point of us having these US spy bases in Australia when we're not even kept in the loop? So sometime after that, Whitlam also discovered that the CIA had infiltrated the Australian Union movement and that ACES, which is the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, had been working with the CIA to topple the left-wing Allende government in Chile. When he found that out, ah, he ordered... the plot thickens. Yeah. So... He, when he found that out, he ordered ACES to stop working with the CIA, but they completely disobeyed his order and kept working with the CIA. Now, not long after that, our Attorney General, a man called Lionel Murphy, he ordered a raid on the ASIO offices, which is the Australian Secret Intelligence Organisation, after it was discovered that they were conspiring with the CIA in an effort to stop our government from making links with Yugoslavia. So this is all coming from the CIA, right? Now, that raid was the last straw, and by 1974, the Nixon administration and CIA regarded Australia as antagonistic. Right? So we weren't going along with their agenda. So... Now, while this was all going on, there's another backstory here. Um, Whitlam had decided to borrow four billion US dollars, which is a lot of money back in those days, to buy back the farm, right, and to develop our own mineral resources. You know, try and get rid of some of these foreign interests. Now, our treasury refused to help him, so 
there was a plan hatched to raise money from Arab wealth funds via intermediaries, which was a really big mistake, and this is something that helped bring their, their government down. Now, one of these intermediaries was a Pakistani banker called Kemlani, Tarath Kemlani, who actually then became an informant for the CIA against the Whitlam government. Um, and he had been working with the resources minister and the deputy prime minister behind Whitlam's back. Now, the problem was that our Australian constitution required that all government borrowings were to be made through what we call the Loans Council. But these guys, they proceeded in attempting to raise the funds, bypassing the Loans Council and the Treasury. So they were trying to do a backdoor kind of um, backdoor um, raising of funds for this buying back our, our farm. Mm -hmm. And they were actually questioned in Parliament about the deal and both um, Rex Connor and Cairns lied and they said that they hadn't authorised the loan but the opposition party proved that they were lying because they'd been fed information by the CIA and the Kemlani informant, CIA informant. So anyway, the, the um, Deputy Prime Minister and the um, Resources Minister were then sacked. And then Whitlam discovered that ASIO had been politicking against the government, planting leaks in, new, in the news regarding our foreign policy and that ASIO um, had Labor Party figures under surveillance. Um, so he actually then, he got really pissed off about this and he instituted a Royal Commission into intelligence agencies in 1974. Oh, boy. That now, the Royal Commission... Normally. Uh, well, yes. So this Royal Commission subsequently revealed that the head of ASIO, um, Peter Barber, had been compromised and he was replaced by a Labor man from the Attorney General's department. Now, normally you would put the deputy um, in control, right? Mm -hmm. But we instead chose to put a civilian in there because he wanted to know what they were doing. So all of a sudden, ASIO were privy to all these secrets before the US kind of found out what had happened. So Whitlam discovered that our security um, agencies were, um, were interfering, um, you know, in all sorts of things. There was a thing about East Timor as well, which I won't go into because it's too complicated, but... Anyway, the head of ISIS was sacked when he was found to be um, compromised. Whitlam then also discovered that the freelance contractor who was in charge of establishing Pine Gap uh, was a CIA agent. Now, his name was Richard Stallings, and Whitlam found out that the CIA had been funnelling money to the opposition party to help take down his government. And also, MI16 was bugging cabinet meetings for the Americans. So, anyway, Whitlam announced that he was going to name all the CIA agents working against the Australian government when Parliament resumed. So he said that publicly. Now, during this time, Sir John Kerr, who was Australia's Governor-General, now DJ talks about him, he was communicating with our opposition leader, Malcolm Fraser, and our High Court Chief, Chief Justice, Garfield Barwick, in a conspiracy against Whitlam. Now, Sir John Kerr had links with the CIA and it was discovered that he had become an informant along with um, that uh, Kemlani. And they were feeding this information to the opposition party to help bring down the, the Whitlam government. So... Um, to understand how um, the role of um, Sir John Kerr, you kind of need to know briefly how Australian Parliament works. So it's got two houses. There's the House of Reps and the Senate. And then you've got the Queen or the Monarch sitting there as well as the third party. Um, now, the Queen is represented through that Governor-General who was Sir John Kerr at the time. Now, the Governor-General has executive powers granted through the Constitution but is ordinarily bound by a convention to act only upon the advice of the government or the Prime Minister. However, he can act independently against advice 
in exercising reserve powers. He was the only person who could dismiss Whitlam, but these powers had never been used before in Australia. Now, just an interesting um, aside here. While we're on the topic of the Queen, Dark Journalist in Episode 8 claims that Queen Elizabeth was behind Whitlam's sacking and that she had worked with Sir John Kerr behind the scenes and he implied that they had colluded in her 1975 visit to Australia and then he flashes these photos of the Queen shaking hands with um, Gough Whitlam and Sir John Kerr. Now, I'm not denying, I don't know, the Queen may have had some involvement, but DJ's got his facts wrong there as well because the Queen did not visit Australia in 1975 she came to Australia in 1974 in February for two days, and this was almost two years before the dismissal. Right? He makes it sound like it was around the same time. It was almost, it was about 22 months um, before. So, okay, so back to Whitlam. Now, the real showdown for Whitlam began when he discovered a cable, because remember now civilians have got a privy to these, you know, cables, it was meant to be agency to agency, saying that the CIA wanted ASIO to continue to lie to the government about Pine Gap's intelligence gathering and had named Whitlam as a security threat. So the CIA had named our Prime Minister a security threat. Right? That's pretty amazing stuff. So now Whitlam assumed that the CIA had been using Pine Gap to spy on him and his government, and he threatened to refuse. He threatened to refuse to renew the leases for the Pine Gap base. Now, crucially, Pine Gap um, lease was up for renewal on December the tenth, nineteen seventy-five. Now, ironically, Whitlam had indicated a year earlier that he would renew the lease, but in response to being named as a security threat in his own country, he said, and I quote try to screw us or bounce us, then Pine Gap will become a matter of contention. Quite a great, brave man. <laughs> anyway. Wow. That so, leave it on the line, didn't it? Yes. Now, the opposition party um, had used its numbers in the Senate to, to actually block our supply bills and did what they wanted a new election. Um, without the passing of the supply bills, all the money would run out and it would only last till the 10th of December. So everything's getting compressed in time here. Now, the opposition, remember, they'd been, they'd been you know, having um, information, um, intelligence funneled to them by the CIA, right, to bring Whitlam down. So they, they'd been attempting to block supply. Now, they justified this stance because of the poor state of the economy. We, um, there was a budget blowout. Whitlam had instituted all these new programs, which I mentioned before. Australia was in recession. We had high in, un, um, inflation and high unemployment, as well as that the loans scandal, you know, when they found out that, you know, we'd been trying to get these loans through Arab wealth funds. Mm -hmm. So they that their justification for blocking supply. Now, Whitlam, in an effort to break the supply deadlock, went to see Sir John Kerr on November the 11th, 1975, to try and get um, him to agree to call a half-Senate election, hoping the Australian public would vote enough Labor people in to get the, you know, to get his um, supply bill through. But when he went there to visit Sir John Kerr, John Kerr turned around and dismissed Whitlam and made the... He commissioned the leader of the opposition, Malcolm Fraser, as caretaker prime minister until the election the following month. So Whitlam was dismissed the very same day he had indicated publicly that he was going to name all the CIA agents who had infiltrated government departments and his own Labor Party. And he was about to name Richard Stallings as a CIA agent and inform the House, Parliament, of CIA interference in Australian domestic and foreign affairs. He never got to do any of that 
because Sir John Kerr sacked him on the very same day. Now, there was subsequent to that, there was an intense media campaign against Whitlam, led by Mal uh, Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch, and financed by the CIA. They lost the election the following month to a landslide win to the opposition. Now, interestingly, soon after Fraser's opposition was elected, that law requiring foreign investment proposals to be investigated by the Foreign Investment Review Board was repealed. Right, so no more oversight of, um, you know, who was, you know, um, you know, foreign interests in Australian resources. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's, you know, part of why Murdoch was involved in that as well. And he'd cosied up to, um, obviously cosied up to some US pals over there. So um, that meant that foreign investments could once again have easy access to Australia. So um, it was discovered also later that um, what was referred to as the Whitlam problem, which is what the, you know, how they referred to this um, Whitlam's agenda, he was the security threat and it was, it was called the Whitlam problem. It, he had been discussed urgently by CIA Director William Colby. You might remember him. Uh, I that's can't a, hear that's you. That's a very prominent figure. In, yeah, in so the William Colby. Yeah. Colby. And, and the head of MI6, Sir Morris Oldfield. Now, I'm not familiar with him, but apparently it was revealed later in these declassified documents that they had referred to the Whitlam um, problem and had discussed this urgently. In fact, there were over 11,000 secret diplomatic cables sent by the US Embassy in Canberra and consulates in Sydney and Melbourne between the years 1973 and 1976. Um, now, the WikiLeaks Transparency Group has actually incorporated a copy of the entire archive into a single searchable database that's available to historians, journalists and researchers. And actually these were part of some 1.7 million electronic documents that were transferred to the US National Archives and Records Administration in 2006 when they became declassified. So I don't know if you know about those, but anyway. So now, although many of these documents are yet to be studied, they reveal an extraordinary amount of Australian intelligence being leaked to Washington. Mm. Um, former, former Labor members of Parliament, party members, and at least one ex-Labor Prime Minister, I don't know if you've heard his name, Bob Hawke, he was our Prime Minister from 1983 to 1991. Um, he was also Labor Prime Minister. He was actually identified in these documents as a US Embassy confidant. Anyway, just to sum up, um, dark journalists claim that Whitlam was dismissed because he was going to close down Pine Gap. Just not true. Uh, so DJ say, says, and I quote, one of the things he wanted to do when he got into office was to get the military bases out of Australia and one of his targets was Pine Gap. So... I mean, Whitlam was dismissed. His, his dismissal was brought about by the CIA's involvement in Australia's domestic and foreign affairs, which threatened British and American interests in our country. So um, Pine, and Pine Gap's role in that was that it allowed the US administration to spy on the Whitlam government, but it had nothing to do with UFO technology at Pine Gap. It was basically, it was the, um, you know, the, the way... The way to spy on what was going on in Australia. So, um, yeah, I refute um, DJ's claim that um, Whitlam was dismissed because of Pine Gap, as you can see, and I've tried to summarise all this information, which was quite extensive, to, you know, to get the big picture of um, who Gough Whitlam was, what he tried to do, and how that threatened um, the United States and, and Britain and why it was important to get him out. So, and Pine Gap was basically the, the way they got the intelligence. 
on what he was doing and the the way to then funnel that information to to the as the um, opposition and then with the help of Murdoch bring down bring down the government. Uh, yeah. So, so one more time to just reprise this. There is no documentable proof that links uh, uh, UFO technology and Pine Gap directly to what happened with your with uh, Wheatland's government. He was well, dispatched. Yeah, absolutely none that I can find. And look, as I said before, Randy, I've I've looked into all this extensively. I was actually a teenager when he was dismissed. My father was very mm. politically and savvy and this was talked about a lot and um i've never heard of this link before with them um, this is a fairly um recent um conspiracy theory that doesn't really when you look into it it has no legs you know and once you actually look into what was happening in the political scene with the whitlam government and the cia involvement and the murdoch press you know it tells a completely different story well, this, is, so, this is the equivalent of stating that richard nixon uh, was taken out of office over UFOs. I mean, you could make a tangential connection somewhere if you looked hard enough, but the direct facts don't. We, The narrative that you've just presented over the Wheatland affair is preponderance of evidence with vast amounts of data versus a conjecture statement with zero amounts of data. So we reject out of hand um, the claims made by dark journalists that Wheatland was basically dismissed on, on the basis of uh, uh, threatening to terminate Pine Gap and exotic UFO technology. Exactly. And that's why I, I felt the need to go into so much background detail. On yeah, this I know. And it was extraordinary yeah. detail. And thank you for that, because uh, I know it's I know you did incredible research on this. You and I have communicated over a course of about two months and you've continued to send me data and obviously putting this show together was not difficult. It's where you are right now in Australia, the very more early morning hours. And No, it's actually no, it's not it's 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 afternoon. <laughs> oh it's afternoon, okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. It's late here, so um mm -hmm. <laughs> The international dateline's a real tripwire for me. I, I, you, me too. <laughs> you're not only on the opposite side of the world with a different time zone, you're in a different day and in a different season. So, um, yeah. Anyway, um, anything you wanna you wanna you wanna kick in at this point to kind of summarize? Because I think we summarized the major points on the first part of this, and then the last two were obviously Harold Holt. And the Wheatland affair, which took a pretty substantial amount of digging around from your standpoint. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, basically, um, Harold Holt. Um, I can't find any evidence um, to suggest he was got rid of because of Pine Gap. Um, he's the one who signed the treaty. It was only the next year that he disappeared. He was all the way with LBJ. Um, increased our involvement in the um, Vietnam War, was friends with um, LBJ. And, you know, and I've just gone through the whole Whitlam um, scenario and, you know, the background to that. So even though Pine Gap, Gap does get a mention, it's merely as the, um, you know, the way they actually uh, manage to um, get the intelligence to then funnel to the, um, the people to help take Whitlam down, the actual... That wasn't the reason Whitlam was taken down. He he had actually the year before, more or less, um, agreed to extend the leases. But it was you know he was he was um, a very proud man, and he was you know the affront that he felt to be have been called a security risk in his own country as prime minister of his own country by the CIA. Um, that's why he um, said, "Listen, you know, you you know you muck around with us, and you know pine gaps on the you know." Pine gaps on the drawing board. So, um, yeah. Look, the the, uh, the other the other area too. I don't know if you want to go into this at all, but um, 
the the um, possibility of a of a place in Australia if they they were doing some kind of research or or into um, you know reengineering UFOs or whatever. There is this place called Woomera, which was um, it's a huge. It's kind of like more like an Area Fifty One. Um, it's really, really remote, and it's a huge, huge area. What is the name of the place again, Marit? Woomera. Um, it's an Aboriginal name. It's spelled W O M E R A. Woomera. Okay. Got it. And it's um, it's a, it's actually a major aerospace and military facility in South Australia. And it's approximately 450 kilometres northwest or 280 miles northwest of Adelaide, which is the capital of South Australia. Now, this was originally a British Australian project, and it's the largest land based test range in the Western world, and it's been in operation since 1946. It's a prohibited area of 47,000 square miles. Or 122,000 square now, kilometers. This sounds much more like what we would call Area 51 or the um, environs of New Mexico and Arizona, yeah. where we know that, that we have major base operations, underground operations, and major aerospace industries in concert with military operations. That sounds much yeah. more like a candidate. For the type of operations we're talking about than Pine Gap, which is not even isolated. Pine Gap. No. And no. again, we need to point this out. The Pine mm. Gap is accessible to a very large population of over 25,000 people within reasonable distance. Yeah. And um, I actually, in 1980, with my ex-husband and um, ex-sister-in-law, we actually climbed one of those ranges and up one side and down the other, and we were at the perimeter fence line of Pine Gap, and um, we 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 got scared away from um, these um, military kind of police-looking dudes came up on motorbikes and mm -hmm. we were on the outside perimeter of the fence. We could see everything just about, and they you know basically harassed us, and you know we got frightened and, and went away, but. That's that's not a, um, an unusual story. I mean, there are a number of access points where you can, you know, climb a range down the other side, and there you are. Yep, I'm so, within driving. I'm within driving range of at least a dozen major military bases here on the east coast of the United States, and mm -hmm. I've been on the periphery of several of them, including one that's considered to be a secured base. And any of those places where they're highly secured bases with possible underground operations, they're cordoned off for at least 10 to 15 square miles around them, even in terms of visibility. That's yeah. almost almost the, the hallmark of a, of a truly secure, high-intensity base. Yeah. So, you know, we're doing, basically, we're profiling here what is being conjectured about Pine Gap. And I've heard the stories about Pine Gap repeatedly over the years in doing this show. And I've always treated them as a mythology, as something that has some potential tru truth, but doesn't really have the veracity to be on the books as, as, as gospel facts. So we just put that in the, uh, on the shelf and, and go, well, that's interesting, but can't really yeah. prove it. But with all the other nonsense about the, you know, the the naming of Pine Gap and, you know, making out that there's a military base in Australia called Prospero, and I mean, put all that together, and like none of his, all the evidence for his, um, you know, that that he says backs up his claim about what goes on in Pine Gap, none of it has legs. You know, every single bit of evidence when you look into it. Um, is either fabricated, pure fabrication, or cherry picking, you know, really obscure things, you know, that have conspiracy theories or things that have been, you know, conjectured about or speculated on, and putting all that in, you know, together, and and then it sounds almost like a credible kind of um, scenario. So maybe the best way to look at this is that based on this program and all the points uh, that have been refuted factually. 
uh, which were presented as fact in the X series by dark journalists wind up being conjecture at best and loose fables at worst and in some cases just frankly really bad journalism dark or whatever in terms of fact checking and due diligence in researching source documents and digging out the correct timelines and facts and I think both of our interests in doing this, Marie, was basically to put this on the record so that people can begin to assess what they're being sold as, quote, information. And understand that this may actually be a very fun series by dark journalists if you view it as entertainment, much like watching The X-Files or... Um, any number of other great science fiction shows out there, fringe, whatever, but that woven within the fabric of facts is a lot of half truths, sloppy resources, and uh, very bad journalism. And that's why I call them episodes. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, look, as I said at the start, look, you know, I've done the best I can without, you know, I've, I've tried to be as objective as I can and clear about having no agenda. Look, uh, you know, if I've missed something or if I've been inaccurate in some way, I'd like to know about it. And, and um, you know, I'm not saying that I've got everything 100% right, but to the best of my ability, I've presented what I see as the facts. And from my anecdotal evidence, from knowing the area and doing the research, um, it, his story just does not hold up. And um, for anyone who's listening to his information on Pine Gap, you know, well, you know, for me, it's it's not it's not um, it's not valid. Well, I think that's probably a good place to leave it, Marit. Um You've done incredible work in putting this together. I thank you. I know that the people who hear this will be grateful for the work you've done and we'll get all of this documentation put together and put it out. And uh, you and I will talk again soon, I'm sure. Okay. And I'll, um, I'll send you those, um, I'll send you those uh, attachments separately, I think, with okay. the numbers. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we'll put this together and get it out. Thank you, my friend. Right. I guess it's afternoon in Australia in yeah. uh, late spring, right? Yeah, but it's more like winter. We've oh, got snow well, happening. I'm sorry to hear moment. that because <laughs> it's actually winter here and it's cold right now. Yeah. All right, Marie, it was great talking to you. Thank you for your work. Good uh, talking to you too. Good night. All right. Good morning. Thanks, Randy. Bye. Bye. You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com.